But after taking a history and doing an examination, and maybe after doing some basic investigations, um, if you take the important um, uh, features in the history examination and investigations and put them together, sometimes you can ident identify syndromes, that is combinations of uh, symptom science and investigations into characteristic combinations. So that's a advance over just knowing only the symptom. The, uh, the value of a syndrome is that uh, syndromes have um, a list of causes, uh, individual conditions or diseases which cause it. So then uh, you will be immediately remembered, uh, my differential diagnosis is the list of causes in this syndrome. And then the syndromes also have a generally a investigation plan, how to approach the various causes, how to uh, investigate them. And sometimes the syndromes also have treatments because um, you know there may be urgent problems um, and so on, which has to be addressed quickly, even while the cause is not yet known. So, you know, syndromes are very useful. They, they help you to uh, gradually progress from symptoms to the diagnosis. It's like in between those two stages, from the symptom to the diagnosis. It has a list of causes which allows you to remember the, the important ones. It, it has a list of investigations and um, you know, further evaluations that might be um, helpful. And even it even has sometimes treatments which are you know going to be uh, good for the patient uh, while we are waiting for the diagnosis. So acute hepatitis syndrome is also something like that. It's like a syndrome where the patient has a certain characteristic presentation. So I'll explain to you what the presentation is. The patient's clinical illness has um, basically two stages. Uh, uh, let's call it the first and the second stage. Uh, the second stage is very characteristic because they get yellow eyes, they get jaundice. So that is, you know, I mean, if you, uh, if there's someone who comes and says, I have got yellow eyes or jaundice, you don't have to be a doctor or a medical student to say that the patient has hepatitis. You know, even your grandmother will tell you that the patient has hepatitis. So that means that the secret is out when the jaundice happens, appears. The real secret is when the patient is in the first stage when there's no jaundice. So that, that part, the first stage is called the prodrome. Uh, the word prodrome means, pro means before, drome means drama. So it's like before the drama opens, you know, there's a stage when, when you go to see a drama, the curtains are closed and you can't see anything on the stage. That's the prodrome. You might hear some music or whatever, but you, you haven't yet started seeing the drama. When the curtain opens, the drama starts. Then people can see the drama. So that prodrome is before the drama. And the drama is jaundice. So this uh, acute hepatitis syndrome has two stages, the prodrome and the jaundice stage. Now, the prodrome is when the real challenge is present to make a diagnosis because the patient is not yet jaundiced or yellow. What are the symptoms of the prodrome? In the prodrome, the patient has Severe loss of appetite or severe anorexia, not just anorexia. You know, all of us have had anorexia. No? We get hemorrhagia, as various problems from time to time. And then we get anorexia. We can't eat. We can only tolerate some sweets or some very sour food or whatever. And sometimes you can have only certain drinks. Others you can't tolerate. But this is not like that. This is complete anorexia meaning you can't even drink water. It is so severe, you know, that sometimes people who smoke cigarettes, they give up smoking during hepatitis and they never smoke again because during that prodrome, the anorexia is so strong that they can't even bear to put a cigarette onto their lips. Even that taste is unbearable. So that is severe anorexia. So why am I saying all these things to you? I'm saying this because if a patient comes to you with severe anorexia like that, you can ask a few questions. Like, can you tolerate certain drinks like, you know, maybe um, lime juice or Coca-Cola or some uh, spicy food or some, what would you like, or some sweets like jujubes or whatever. Can you tolerate water? If you find the patient's anorexia is complete, that you can't tolerate anything, 
then that is a situation where you must suspect this patient is having acute hepatitis. That's a very characteristic symptom, severe total anorexia. Along with that, they also normally have some nausea. They might have some vomiting. Uh, and uh, if you ask them, sometimes they might say that their urine color is a little darker than usual, maybe a little bit orangish or even like plain tea. Uh, when you examine the patient, you might find there is a tender hepatomegaly. So this is a prodrome. In that situation, if you do the liver biochemistry, the serum ALT and serum AST and alkaline phosphatase and all those investigations, you will find that the ALT and AST are very, very high. Usually at least five times the upper limit of normal. So upper limit is usually 40. So upper limit five times means 200, but usually actually not even three, 400, but actually thousands. So that's very characteristic. Now in the morning, I was talking to you about acute hepatitis due to alcohol. There, the liver biochemistry, ALTST is not normally in the thousands. They are more in the hundreds, like three, four hundred. But in viral hepatitis and drug-induced hepatitis, they are in the thousands. But anyway, they are more than five times the supplement of normal. So in the prodrome, you can suspect because of severe anorexia or total anorexia, and especially if there's gender hepatomegaly, and especially if there's discoloration of urine, uh, dark or painty colored urine, and then you can confirm your suspicion by doing a urine full report and a serum ALT and AST. The urine full report will, will show bile in the urine and ALT and AST will show elevation of ALT and AST more than five times the limit of normal. So even before the, the jaundice appears, even before the curtain has raised on the stage, you can say this patient is having acute hepatitis or acute inflammation of the liver. A few days later, the patient will develop the jaundice or the yellow eyes and by that time, the urine color is definitely dark colored. And the patient, then of course, anybody can make the diagnosis. The second stage. And normally, what you find is that in the second stage, the patient's uh, 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 anorexia actually starts to improve. Then they say, I can eat something now. And, uh, you know, they can drink a little water and so on, even if they did not tolerate water earlier. And then they might have uh, some few new symptoms like, for example, especially itching of the body can happen. And uh, normally they stay like that for a week or two and gradually their urine color becomes normal again, their uh, eye color becomes normal again and they recover and the liver biochemistry also starts to recover. So this is the acute hepatitis syndrome, the prodrome and then the jaundice or icteric phase. The prodrome, severe anorexia or total anorexia with nausea and vomiting and some urine discoloration, examination, tender hepatomegaly, investigations, ALTST, uh, more than five times upper limit of normal. Uh, Icteric phase, they become jaundiced and they gradually become a little bit better in terms of anorexia and so on. Uh, that is, uh, I'm, I'm mainly describing the viral hepatitis syndrome, but uh, in other conditions also, it can be very similar, but at least the first few days, it's definitely similar. So what are the causes of this acute hepatitis syndrome? First of all, there are other infections. There is viral hepatitis and there's non-viral causes of hepatitis. Now viral hepatitis, there are two groups. There are those viruses which only attack the liver. They are called the hepatotropic viruses. And there are viruses which are general viral infections which attack various organs, in, including the liver. So the hepatotropic viruses are, there are two groups. Uh, uh, some viruses are transmitted by the fecal oral route hepatitis A virus and hepatitis E virus. Uh, some are transmitted by blood and body fluids and sexual transmission. They are the hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus and hepatitis D virus. Uh, then the non-hepatotropic viruses, which are general virus infections, which also affect the liver. It includes Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, Velcella zoster virus, which are all herpes viruses, and they generally have a Generalized febrile illness with the generalized lymphadenopathy, uh, liver spin enlargement. In the case of basal uh, of virus, of course, you have the, the skin rash uh, and so on. Non viral causes include in Sri Lanka, a very important cause is leptospirosis. And uh, especially in, in the northern province, in, in Jaffna Peninsula, you have a lot of amoebiasis. So, those are infections. Uh, among the drugs and chemicals, the commonest is alcohol. And then there are medications that we prescribe which can cause hepatitis. That includes uh, paracetamol, anti-TB drugs, 
uh, phenytoin, valproate, and propyl thiourosyl. Now, you, in case you didn't know, uh, uh, phenytoin and valproate are anti-epileptic drugs, and propyl thiourosyl is a anti-thyroid drug. That is a drug given for thyrotoxicosis. Then CAM. CAM stands for complementary and alternative medicine. Complementary and alternative medicine, like you know, Ayurveda and so on. So various green teas, various weight-reducing herbals, uh, you know, like uh, 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 diet herbals, and there's a special medicine called ephedra. They, they are well known to cause acute hepatitis. And always watch out for possible occupational exposure to chemicals. So when a patient comes to you with the acute hepatitis syndrome, um, if the patient says, I'm working in, say, a factory, um, so make sure to ask about what does the work involve. Then the patient might say, I, I, I work with solvents, I work with various chemicals and so on. And then immediately you must ask the patient to um, furnish you a list of the chemicals that he comes across. He might not know the names. So then he will have to ask his uh, human, uh, human resources division or HR division. And, uh, you know, they are normally very helpful. They, they give the list of chemicals that these patients come across. And then you can check whether these chemicals are the cause of hepatitis. It's very important to check that because unless you check that and take some action, uh, on the one hand, your patient will go back to the same environment and will never get cured. On the other hand, other workers in that environment, environment might also get affected. And uh, that's important to you know. It's a very important thing to do for a doctor to prevent that kind of calamity. And uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, usually factories, when they are told these things, they uh, usually they are very cooperative. They, they try to uh, either uh, prevent the chemical exposure by giving them various uh, equipment and so on. Another important cause of acute hepatitis syndrome is acute exacerbations of chronic hepatitis. Now, basically what this means is there is a condition called chronic hepatitis also, that is long-standing hepatitis. But in that long-standing illness, they are not ill all the time. They become ill from time to time, episodically. Sometimes they might come to us during an episode. And in that particular episode, might look like acute hepatitis. So on presentation, you might not realize it's a chronic hepatitis. Sometimes even the patient might not realize it's a chronic hepatitis. But it might be the first presentation. Then there are some causes of acute hepatitis just specific for pregnancy. Uh, so I have listed them. I'm not, I'm not going to deal with them here in this lecture, but they're very important. Um, uh, they should be dealt somewhere else. I hope they're dealt somewhere else. So preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HELP syndrome, they go together. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy is very similar. Intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, which can also actually happen during uh, uh, non-pregnant times also if the patient is on the oral contraceptive pill. Uh, Hyperemesis gravidarum and Bhatkari syndrome. So these are specific for pregnancy except for intrahepatic cold states of pregnancy which is actually due to estrogen. So it can happen when the patient is taking the uh, estrogen containing uh, contraceptive pill also. So these are the causes of acute hepatitis. So basically the management is, uh, bed rest is very important. It's, it's important to make sure the patient does not fatigue himself or herself because the liver is unable to withstand the fatigue and the patient quickly goes into hypoglycemia. Because as you know, when you're working hard, let's say for example, you are doing sports or running or doing some gardening or whatever, the muscle glucose consumption increases and what the liver does is it breaks down its glycogen through glycogenolysis and maintains blood glucose levels. Now, in this situation, acute hepatitis, the liver can't maintain the glucose level because its glycogenolysis is impaired. And therefore, if the patient works hard, the patient can go into, quickly go into hypoglycemia and lose consciousness. Sometimes, uh, I mean, I have, I, in my internship, I remember uh, I came across a, a patient like that. That was a young girl. She was about 13, 14 years old, school child, school girl. So the mother, one day she woke up and said that uh, she is having fever. And the mother said, okay, you stay home. Don't go to school today. <laughs> but this is a rural area. Uh, I was working in Badul and this patient is from Bellavai, close by. So these are rural areas. And the mother, you know, uh, just because the child is at home, they don't have the luxury of looking after children and all that. They have to go to work. They have to go to, to look for uh, 
um, bring water from the river, they had to bring firewood uh, to cook and so on. So the father has gone to work and the mother has gone for that. And the, this child, this girl, she had a younger brother. Uh, so the Akka and the Mali were playing in the morning. So when the mother left, Akka and Mali were playing. When the mother came back, the Mali was there, the Akka was unconscious. And she was brought to us and it turned out to be the prodromal phase of acute hepatitis with severe hypoglycemia. And she was unconscious and actually she went into acute hepatic failure also. So that's why it's important to bed rest. You must not uh, stress the liver. You must also maintain hydration because I said earlier they have severe anorexia. They might not even drink water. So they might become quickly dehydrated. So it's very important to check the hydration and encourage hydration. We might give a medication to reduce nausea and vomiting and even start a drip or whatever. If the patient is malnourished, it's important to give nutrition supplements for vitamins and trace minerals especially and even calories. And then those are the basic things you have to do, you know, basically, especially if you are a family doctor, a general practitioner, encourage blood rest, maintain hydration, give some nutrition and supplement, um, and so on. And then we can assess the degree of liver dysfunction. We can do that using serum transaminases, uh, prothrombin time, and serum bilirubin. And hospital admission is not always necessary. The, I would say that the majority of patients with acute hepatitis are managed at home. But then you must watch for complications. That's very important. One complication is acute hepatic encephalopathy. I, may, I explained to you that well also. Uh, there can be prolonged cholestasis. That is, when the patient recovers from the hepatitis syndrome itself, uh, the yellowness, the yellow eyes, and the itching continues. That's called prolonged cholestasis. Now, some causes produce chronic hepatitis. Not all the causes I mentioned earlier. Some causes only produce acute hepatitis, others cause chronic hepatitis also. So therefore, if the cause in your patient is a chronic hepatitis causing condition, then it's important to follow up the patient after the acute hepatitis to see whether they go into chronic hepatitis. So for example, in hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, alcohol, medications, autoimmune hepatitis, metabolic causes, they can lead to chronic hepatitis, so that follow-up is required in those cases. So, uh, um, if I can just go back to this slide, if you ask me what are the medications you give these patients, really you don't have to give any medications uh, because uh, unless if you want to maintain hydration by giving uh, intravenous fluids, if you want to give something for the vomiting, so like anti-emetic, uh, that's all really, but even the fever is usually not very pronounced. In fact, it's more important to stop the medications because if the, patient's having, if the patient is having acute hepatitis, it's very important for you to go through the list of medications the patient may have been taking earlier, you know, various uh, previous medications like uh, hypertension, diabetes, and all those things. So then it's important to look at the list of medications because you may have to stop some of those medications because the liver is not well. Uh, of course, if there are complications, we have to treat them, uh, for example, like your hepatitis and hepatic encephalopathy requires treatment, prolonged uh, cholestasis, sometimes we give some medications and so on. Among the causes of acute hepatitis, sometimes we give treatment for uh, uh, hepatitis B. There's a medication called lamivudine, lamivudine, which is given for those patients. We give medications for cytomegalovirus and uh, varicella zoster virus. So cytomegalovirus, we give um, Valgancyclovir, of course, VZV, we give uh, acyclovir. Leptospirosis, of course, we treat with uh, antibiotics. Antibiotics also we treat with metronidazole. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically that's the treatment for those conditions, specific treatment, not many. Now, with regard to hepatitis viruses, so uh, in the um, in Sri Lanka, the commonest causes are hepatitis A virus and hepatitis E virus, both of which are fecal oral transmitted. So for hepatitis A virus, we can do the anti-HAV IgM antibodies uh, and hepatitis E virus, we do the anti-HEV antibodies. Rarely it is due to hepatitis B, for which the tests are the hepatitis B surface antigen or the anti-HB co-antibodies IgM, and that's normally seen in high-risk patients who are prone to get blood and body fluid infections. And uh, sexual transmitted infections. 
And remember, the, it may be part of extremely cleaner, such as chicken box or EBV or such a regular virus. Hepatitis C virus is very uncommon in Sri Lanka, rare in Sri Lanka, um, and uh, even among high risk people. And uh, even in those patients who have hepatitis C, it's usually a chronic hepatitis, not an acute hepatitis. In other words, they don't present as acute hepatitis, they are always present as a chronic hepatitis. So this is just a graph showing hepatitis C virus and its symptoms. You can see the, uh, the first graph to rise is the light blue one, that is a hep C RNA level, virus first. And then as it falls, the transaminase starts to rise. And then that's when they might get a bit of jaundice. Uh, and then as it falls, they have the antibodies coming out much later. So if you do the antibodies to diagnose hepatitis C, normally the patient has recovered or it's too early. So basically, what I'm trying to say through this graph is that uh, depending on the antibody for hepatitis C, it's not very good. If you really suspect hepatitis C, you must do the RNA. Uh, the hepatitis B by the polymerase chain reaction. Um, so I mentioned acute alcohol hepatitis in the morning, so I won't uh, mention it again here. And I have mentioned some hepatitis causes uh, specific for pregnancy. But remember, even in pregnancy, the usual medical causes like viral hepatitis can cause hepatitis in pregnancy also. And sometimes even surgical causes like gallstones can cause a similar jaundice-like picture. Okay, so let me move on to chronic hepatitis. Um, so basically, uh, here the inflammation of the liver is not acute, but a chronic low-grade continuous inflammation. Uh, their presentation is more subtle and mostly with non-specific clinical features. So normally they might have a little bit of uh, weakness or fatigue. They might say, a doctor, I used to work very hard those days. I used to do sports and things, but now I don't have the energy, doctor. When I work, I feel very tired and very fatigued easily. In the evening, it's very bad and I just want to rest. And my appetite, doctor, I used to be able to eat anything, but now I don't want to eat much also. That kind of symptoms, you know, very subtle and very non-specific. They don't come with specific features, uh, specific for the liver, such as jaundice and so on. So normally these patients are, when they come with chronic hepatitis like that, uh, doctors might do liver tests, but usually they might forget to do that. So they might not get picked up very easily. They might give a vitamin supplement or something and see. So it's very important when they come with non-specific subtle features, vague features, to look for organ problems like that, chronic organ pro problems like that. For example, you can check um, um, liver disease, kidney disease, or sometimes even autoimmune disease, chronic low-grade infections like tuberculosis or infective endocarditis. So it's very important to do some investigations and see whether all the organs are okay. We normally do a full blood count, CRP, ESR, uh, but in the case of chronic hepatitis, all three are normal. It might be a little high, you know, you might have a slight elevation of CRP, but not very high. So it's also important to check the liver profile, the ALT, AST. In the case of chronic kidney disease, it's important to do the serum creatinine and so on. So just a, a few basic investigations would be very valuable in these non-specific sort of presentations because we don't know what is happening. So most chronic hepatitis patients are actually picked up accidentally during routine screening. Like, for example, if they come for a health check at 40 years before a life insurance or whatever, that might show the chronic hepatitis. Or most patients are picked up during their follow-up for acute hepatitis. I, earlier, I mentioned that uh, after acute hepatitis, if the cause can cause chronic hepatitis, also we need to follow up, like hepatitis B, for example. Then on follow-up, they might turn out to develop chronic hepatitis. So chronic hepatitis itself is not a specific, uh, it's, not, it's not picked up very easily unless you maintain a very high index of, of suspicion uh, for non-specific presentations. Usually they are picked up during routine screening or during follow-up of acute hepatitis cases. And their management is generally a little 
complicated because it needs long term monitoring of their liver tests their symptoms and sometimes you have to do a liver biopsy also sometimes several biopsies not just once it was 6 months or whatever why is that that's because in order to get a full idea about exactly what is happening in the liver whether it is getting better or getting worse you need this follow up and investigations that is because chronic hepatitis is not a very dynamic rapidly progressive disease it's a very slowly progressive disease so although there is time to make a diagnosis it also means you have to uh, follow up the patient on the long term and you know when you see patients in the wards and clinics you will realize that follow up of our patients very difficult they normally they default they they don't come for follow up they after about um, two or three months when they don't feel very ill they think that is enough and they give up so we lose these cases of follow up and then they will come back later on in a very bad situation with cirrhosis and so on so this is the sequence of events first of all they might get acute hepatitis then they might progress to chronic hepatitis if the cause is a cause of chronic hepatitis and then if they are left alone sometimes they might get cirrhosis so remember that uh, every cause is not a chronic hepatitis cause only some causes are chronic hepatitis causes others cause only acute hepatitis and even if it is a cause that is known to cause chronic hepatitis such as say hepatitis b every patient who gets acute hepatitis due to hepatitis b does not going to become chronic hepatitis only a small minority will develop chronic hepatitis so in those cases of acute hepatitis if we know that the cause can lead to chronic hepatitis we do follow up but they they normally they don't get get chronic hepatitis anyway they recover fully fortunately but we must follow up because we have to pick up the chronic hepatitis if it does happen and even those who do get chronic hepatitis don't always go into great cirrhosis only some go into cirrhosis so that is why i say you need to follow up these patients very carefully for a long time uh, and uh, watch whether they are going into cirrhosis or not so what are the common and important cause of chronic hepatitis i think the commonest is chronic alcoholic liver disease second is hepatic effects of systemic disease especially non alcoholic acute hepatitis or nash which is part of the metabolic syndrome renomatous hepatitis liver disease such as tuberculosis and so on or sarcoidosis and so on medications then autoimmune liver disease such as autoimmune hepatitis primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosing cholangitis and chronic viral hepatitis especially hepatitis b virus and rarely hepatitis c hepatitis d virus is of course a, a virus which always happens only if the patient has hepatitis b and then there are the inherited liver diseases such as hemochromatosis which is because due to excess of iron in the body wilson disease which is due to an excess of copper in the body and alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency which is due to a lack of a certain enzyme alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency so these are the common and important causes of hepatitis the chronic hepatitis so if i can just go through that list let me let me go by one by one chronic alcoholic liver disease you know it's treatable if you can stop the patient from consuming alcohol you can save the patient in the case of nash it's treatable you may, if you can get the patient to lose weight and can control their diabetes you can prevent nash from going into cirrhosis remember the liver disease such as autoimmune liver disease especially autoimmune hepatitis is treatable with immunosuppression chronic viral hepatitis there are antiviral medications in the case of hepatitis b actually it's uh b and c, for both b and c it's available free of charge in the government hospitals then inherited liver diseases hemochromatosis and wilson's disease are both treatable so what i'm trying to say is that if you take this list of chronic hepatitis almost all of them are eminently treatable and you can prevent cirrhosis so you can see what a important condition chronic hepatitis is if you leave it alone they go they could go into cirrhosis and that's terrible but if you pick it up in time you could prevent a cirrhosis and they might lead a normal life or almost normal life 
but it's difficult to diagnose because as i said earlier the presentation is very non specific and very vague so you must be very looking out for this sort of cause in those patients because it's fully worth it if you can make a diagnosis then there is often so much you can do you can make a difference <laughs> So I, I, I'll make a list of the medications that cause hepatitis according to the specialty because, you know, we have these clinics, endocrine clinic, neuro clinic, psychiatric clinic and so on. So then it's very easy if you're working in a certain clinic, uh, let's say you're working in a diabetes clinic in the future, make sure you know the cause of chronic hepatitis so that you can watch out for that. So in the case of endocrinology, uh, pioglitazone and A-carbos are both uh, anti-diabetes drugs, and phutomide is a drug given for adrenocortical diseases. Uh, sorry, it is an uh, androgenic, uh, anti-androgenic uh, medication. Uh, drugs used in neuro neurology include phenytoin, carbamazepine, valproate, phenobarbital, which are all anti-epileptics, and tac tacrine was uh, an old uh, Alzheimer's disease medicine. I don't think they use it anymore because there are safer medications now. Drugs used in psychiatry, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, serotonin and noadrenaline reuptake inhibitors, uh, bupropion, risperidone. These are basically uh, antidepressants, the first four are antidepressants, but they are given for other conditions also like uh, uh, OCD and so on. Bupropion is an anti-anxiolytic. This peridone is given for a variety of conditions, actually. Drugs used in infections, uh, ketoconazole, fluconazole, itroconazole, which are all antifungals. Uh, Trovofloxacin is an antibiotic uh, similar to ciprofloxacin. And antiretroviral therapy given for HIV. Drugs used in cardiology, methyl dopa, captopril, indopril, lisinopril, dosartan, all antihypertensives. Quinidine, which is an antiarrhythmic, chlorothiazide, nifedipine, verapamil, and diltiazem, which are also antihypertensive. Now, these medications are given to thousands and thousands of patients, and they cause chronic hepatitis only rarely. So, don't worry if the, if the patient is on those medications, don't worry. I mean, it's a very, very rare side effect of uh, these medications. But I'm just telling so that you will be on the watch out for any patient who might have a liver disease. Uh, you should not give prescribing them. Or if the patient is on these medications and develops uh, chronic liver disease, you must suspect and stop the medication. I think the only common cause of in this whole list is methyl dopa. Again, not very common, but uh, somewhat common would be methyl dopa. Drugs used in rheumatology, uh, ibuprofen, indomethacin, diclofenac, solintac, which are all NSAIDs, Allopurinol, which is given to reduce uh, uric acid levels. And then methotrexate, which is a, a DMAD, uh, disease modifying agent, which is given for rheumatoid arthritis and uh, various medications, uh, various conditions, autoimmune conditions, and also skin diseases. So you can see there's quite a list, and even there, there are others also, which I have not mentioned. It's a very long list. I thought I'll take the most important ones and list here. Uh, chronic viral hepatitis in Sri Lanka is very rare, fortunately. Uh, specific drug therapy is a very evolving and advancing field. Uh, so I won't go into details of that. But the important thing to tell you is that both Hep C and Hep B are treatable. And medications are available in Sri Lanka in our government hospitals, in special clinics. Uh, for example, in, in the Chessel Gastro Clinic has these medications. Uh, so, if you do pick up a patient, refer to them, they will look after the patient and follow up also. NASH uh, is part of the metabolic syndrome. Uh, it can happen outside the metabolic syndrome also, but it's usually part of the metabolic syndrome. And the prognosis is worsened in these patients, both because of the liver disease as well as because of the worse cardiovascular morbidity. So you have to treat both the cardiovascular aspect of it, the metabolic syndrome aspect of it, as well as watch out for the uh, liver aspect of it. So with regard to the liver disease, uh, diagnosis and treatment are still evolving. It's, uh, so far, we don't have a proven medication, but I think another 
five years or ten years time, definitely there will be, be some proven medication for Nash also. Autoimmune liver disease. There's a array of autoantibodies which are used to diagnose, such as anti-nuclear factor, anti-smooth muscle antibodies, anti-liver kidney or LK microsomal antibodies, and the mitochondrial antibodies, and anti-soluble liver antigen antibodies. So these are fairly expensive investigations. If you do it in the private sector, the whole spectrum will cost you about, I think I'm not very sure about the cost, but maybe about 20,000 rupees. In the state sector, of course, they are not always available. Uh, but uh, we need to do those investigations in selected cases if you suspect autoimmune liver disease. And if it is diagnosed, the treatment is generally uh, with immunosuppression, uh, with uh, prednisolone. And uh, usually they do very well and they recover from that and they lead very good lives and they don't go into cirrhosis. So it's a very important condition to diagnose. Inherited liver diseases. Uh, for hemochromatosis, the test is serum ferritin. For Wilson disease, it's serum free copper and cerebral plasmin levels. And for alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency, the easier test to do is a serum protein electrophoresis because you see that the alpha 1 band is reduced because of the deficiency. But the specific test is an alpha 1 AT assay. These are worth detecting because there's treatment to improve the long term outcome. For example, in the case of hemochromatosis, you can do vene section dysperioxinine and check for cardiac and endocrine effects and so on. In the case of recent disease also there is treatment such as prinsilamine, triantine and zinc salts. So basically that's what I wanted to cover today with you, the acute present chronic hepatitis. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay, then thank you. Thank you. Thank you.